Isn't that good? You, that should get a, a hand clap, don't you think? In four minutes, the story of the gracious God is demonstrated. Wow. Let us pray. So, Father God, thank you for this day. We celebrate the assembly of your body together. Those who are seeking to know more of you, seeking the, some here that are seeking to know you for the first time. That, Father God, you would uh, use your Holy Scripture as a foundational to the New Testament church, that it would be um, read and uh, declared in its purpose and in, in its destiny that it has as it was inspired and recorded. So, Father God, we ask that you give us open hearts, open minds, attentive ears to um, press into your word today. In your name we pray. Amen. So, um, in following what we are trying to do as leaders here is to focus on Sunday morning on the Apostles' Doctrine. And so, with that, I don't think it's any... There are a lot of choices we could make, but today we're going to start a journey through the book of Ephesians. And the book of Ephesians has um, really many core principles of the New Testament church. And I think that's the part that as we are learning to be the church, we need to understand what the model, what the, in, uh, the inspiration and direction and instruction of the New Testament church are. So we're going to start with the book of Ephesians and... If you don't have the handout, raise your hand. I'm going to get everybody to get a handout because today there's more blanks. For all of you who like filling in the blank exercises, yes, I know you're out there. Um, there's more blanks. And I really want you to have this because at the end of the day, we don't do this to be left here in the seat. Yeah. I find way too many of your notes left in the seat. And I would encourage you that reading these at other times when you're inspired is very, very important. Not for me, but for you. All right. I could see as I was looking around, there were empty hands. Not empty today, that's right. All right, well, let's get going. So we're going to do Ephesians 1, verse 1 through 14. And the title of this series is The Majesty of Christ Revealed. You know, there is so much truth throughout the, from Genesis to Revelation. And it ultimately... It is about the revelation of a majestic king, a savior, a son of the living God. So when we talk about Ephesians, it's important to level set. So Saul, who later became Paul, was trained as a rabbi. In fact, Gamaliel, which was the high, high probably the highest order of the rabbinical teachers, and he, Paul, Saul, then soon to be Paul, studied under this leader. And in fact, um, he reached the heights of being on the Supreme Court of the Jewish faith, the Sanhedrin, which was the Supreme Court. In studying law and pursuing legalism as a source of righteousness. So again, the Jewish faith was the only way to be in God was to be righteous because of the law. That prepared Paul, one, after he spent time persecuting the, the church. And in fact, Gamaliel made a statement when several of the apostles were arrested and beaten and threatened. There was this private moment that he speaks to the other rabbis and say, look, if this is not of God, we don't have to worry about it. It'll go away. But if it's of God, there's nothing we can do about it. Wow. So he was wise. He knew as a great teacher, but he also recognized there had been other moves of rebellion against the Jewish faith. But there was something very different about this one. 
And he said, let me just tell you, if it's of God, we can do nothing about it. So remember that. The things of God today, the enemy can do nothing about it. Okay? We have to walk in that. Okay? So as Paul wrote this letter, he was in prison. So he had previously spent two years with the church in Ephesus. So he knew these folks that he's writing this letter to. He knew their hearts. So this word, these letter, this letter he wrote to the church in Ephesus was probably done around 55 A.D., some 25 years after Jesus' death, resurrection, and ascension. So when, it, when we study the book of Ephesians, it teaches us a word that we need to hardwire, and that's called discipline. Discipleship, discipline. The discipline needed to develop into the child of God that he destined us to be, leading us to maturity and ultimately fulfilling our purpose and destiny. God has given this because we see in later in Ephesians that the fivefold ministry is to equip the saints for what? The work of the ministry. Okay? So this book gives all the foundational principles for that. So as we dig in, I want to give you the first blanks. This is about the mission of the church. The first one is to form a body to express Christ's fullness on the earth. Okay, we have to have the body function, okay? Number two, executed, the mission is executed by uniting us to one people among whom God himself dwells. Foundational principle of the new church is unity. Unity of the faith, unity of spirit, unity of truth. The third mission of the church is to equip, empower, and mature. So one of the things that happens, we, born, we see a lot of babies born into the kingdom, but we don't see the incremental steps of growth and maturation and adulthood. Because if we don't have parents in the kingdom, it's hard to have children in the kingdom. Okay, So that's one of the principles of the mission of the church, is we have to be willing to not only equip, empower, but grow people up in the faith, that they can walk in it, and they use all their gifts and talents talents that God has given them. So as we start, we're going to go a couple of verses at a time and provide some context. And so starting with, in the New King James, we'll read today Ephesians 1, verses 1 and 2. So Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God, to the saints who are in Ephesus and faithful in Christ Jesus, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. So remember, this is a principle when John, Pastor John talked about our identity in Christ. We talked about when we talked about being spiritually, alive, uh, be spiritually dead, then become spiritually alive. You went from a sinner state to a saint state. So realize he knew the people he was writing this letter to. So he didn't write it to sinners and saints. He wrote it to saints. So saints are defined as holy people called by God, and they're only made holy through his salvation, not anything they could do. They were made holy through his salvation who are sharing in Christ's inheritance. So we're going to talk about a lot about inheritance and acceptance and being sealed. These are terms that you, you need to, to fully understand because they verify your relationship with the Lord and with the things that come with that relationship. So we talked about a few weeks ago, Satan can do nothing to damage your identity in Christ. Repeat after me, Satan can do nothing to disturb or banish my relationship with Christ. Okay? He can't do that. He has no power. He has no authority. He can deceive you into believing something you, that was generated by a toxic emotion relating to a bad memory, meaning to something you believe. So guess what? Jesus erases that through his blood. But you have to make the commitment to see yourself not as a sinner, but as a saint. We have to choose to live according to the the mindset of Christ, 
and not the debil debilitating thoughts of the past. I say that because I had someone to, a few weeks ago said, I can never see myself as a saint. I said, why? He says, God couldn't possibly forgive me for the things that I did. Wow. So that's why we have babes that don't understand that. They don't understand the principle of the blood of Christ and the covering of the sin, and that that's how our Father sees us, covered by the, the blood of, of Jesus Christ. So as we move through the next uh, 11 verses, so I always like to look at the, the context and how these scriptures, this letter was written. So Paul actually, in the Greek writing, wrote this as a poem. The next 11 verses were a poem. Now, I'm not about to read it as a poem because I'm sure I would mess it up and I don't know Greek. And so, but recognize that sometimes there is, it's like the poetry is really birthed out of the heart of Paul, okay? It was just his, his passion. He wanted you to understand, he wanted the saints to understand what this relationship with Jesus Christ was all about. So let's read the, the next uh, the third and fourth verse. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ, just as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy without blame before him in love. So there's two components, spiritual blessing, which is on your handout, and chose. So we're going to talk about both of those things. So what's interesting, this idea of spiritual blessing is a divine privilege that's available only to those who are in Christ. This privilege is similar to spiritual gifts that we see referenced in 1 Corinthians chapter 12. So that position of when we become alive in Christ and we acknowledge him, his lordship, that the position, and we're going to talk a lot about position and not person today, that position of a believer that now is changed and different, and then now he's, he's, a, he's been blessed by the redemption of his soul. Okay, We move from the dead state to the live state. And with that live state come these benefits and this is what Paul is trying to make sure that the, that the church in Ephesus knows what those are. You know, again, remember, he's speaking to saints. So when he says, as he chose us, okay, Paul is talking about the saints and himself. He chose us in him when? Before what? The foundation of the world. That, he sh that we should be holy and without blame before him in love. I want to ho I hope to get some, provide you some clarification of some of these words because there are denominational belief systems that have been built on some of these words that we're about to cover that you have to recognize denominationalism doesn't always reflect this, okay? It doesn't mean that it's, it's, it's bad, but there, we can swing to one side or the other on certain items of which Paul recorded. The first one is the chose us before the foundation of the world. It's very clear in Scripture that the word chose is used frequently. It's frequently referenced to um, men, in, men in, the, in the Old Testament, such as Noah was chosen, Abraham, Moses, David. Jeremiah, in one, chapter 1, verse 5, says... You were formed in your mother's room. I sanctified you and ordained you as a prophet. So there's very clear the person is the, the function of that person was you are now going to be a prophet in the case of Jeremiah. David, you're going to be a king. You know, Moses, you're going to lead them out of, uh, out of, out of, the, out of the, uh, slavery in Egypt. If you think about uh, what Peter said, Peter said in 1 Peter 1, 2 says, he addressed the elect and the chosen. He says, you are chosen and elect. That means to your state, when you are in Christ, you now have the personhood of a person that's chosen. If I don't accept the invitation, I can't be chosen. 
What did Jesus say in the parable of the wedding feast? Many are what? Called. Few are? Chosen. They're chosen because they failed to accept the invitation. So what happened? The invitation went all out and nobody showed up. Okay? So don't get goofy about this chosen thing. It's the chosen is, did you choose? Did you choose to accept the message of salvation? The whole series we watch now in our second season, that's the chosen. It's about the folks that said, follow me. And they said, yes. I love this, the scene where they come together and they say it together. What is it? What is it? Philip that does that. They get it done quickly. They say, follow me, I will. They say it simultaneously. You know, the beauty of that is this is what happens when we are come and we accept the invitation to be attendees in the case of the parable of the wedding feast so many are called that message of calling in my opinion it went to every human being created in the image of God he wants to have relationship with every one of them but only some will choose to accept that invitation so Galatians um, 1, 15 and 16, this is what Paul said about his experience. But when it pleased God, who separated me from my mother's womb and called me through his grace to reveal his son to me, that I might preach him. He's talking about that he knew that there was, when he became chosen, he had a destiny, he had a purpose that God hardwired in him. And we're going to talk a lot about destiny and the will of God as we go through this because these are terms that people can maybe not have always had a good, firm, clear biblical understanding. So um, I'm going to ask uh, Amy to display this image because we're going to dig into one of those principles that have led to denominational structure. And the image is on the left... Hopefully it's the left, yeah. It's the sovereignty of God, or God's sovereignty. On the right is human responsibility. Those are two things that are on your handout. There are blanks below it. So I love what Neil Anderson has dealt with the whole idea of predestination, which is under God's sovereignty, and under human responsibility is free will. So if you think about the... Um, debates that have occurred and where people have defined their uh, sort of their denominational belief system is you can be heavy on the left that it's all about God's sovereignty or you could be heavy on the right it's all about human responsibility well the truth is each of those have their own domain God's not going to do something that you're responsible for Okay, so God, under his domain, God will do what he does and has done. He created the universe. He accomplished his purposes today by working the creative order. Those who are in him, who are willing to execute on his behalf, he works through that. He upholds all things. He guarantees all things by the, his word that's recorded and the truth that comes from that word. And, and so when, when you think about this God's sovereignty, okay, we're good. That's his, the domain of God. The domain of humanity has their own domain. Let me read a couple of things. First of all, a human must assume responsibility for their own attitudes and their own actions. At the end of the day, the, count, the, the fallen, spiritually dead person has act, actions and attitudes that are part of being spiritually dead. When you come to Christ, you're accountable to a new set of actions and attitudes. How do you see the world? Are you still in charge? You know, I want to I have the assurance of my salvation, but I don't want to give up control of my life. That's an attitude and an action that you'll be humanly responsible for before God. What else? Are we, are we are irresponsible when we ask God to do what he told us to do. Think about that for a minute. God's not, we're not his puppet, he's not our puppet. It's up to us to be responsible for the things that God told us to do. 
So to think that we're not all called to share the good news, I'm sorry. That's a byproduct of a relationship. When you have something precious and valuable that the rest of the world needs, we got to give that away. That's our responsibility. See, if you say it's all, all uh, predestination or God's sovereignty for people that are going to get in or not get in, I'm sorry. I, there's a human responsibility in Christ. And you, you see that this is, you know, when the Lord told me to do this, I'm going... That word predestines in here twice, Lord. But as I studied it, I began to understand it. And then I happened to read some of Neil Anderson's things and talking about sovereignty. We don't want to limit the sovereignty of God, but we don't want to say human responsibility is everything. You see what I mean? There's this balance between both of those. Okay? So let's dig in next. Now we're going to see that word. Ephesians 1, verse 4 through verse 6, because I'm going to pick back up at the last one I read and then move into two new ones. So it's good to read this in context. So he chose us in him before the foundations of the world that we should be holy without blame before him in love. So when we are in him, we are chosen. And with that, we were known to be that way because that was his heart for all of us that we should be holy without blame before him. That eliminates the whole idea that your, your sin nature is still going to blame you. Okay, You're not still under the curse of your sin. Then he says, having predestined us to adoption as sons by Jesus Christ to himself, according to the good pleasure of his will, to the praise of the glory of his grace by which he made us accepted in the beloved. So there's three words there. Predestined, adoption, and accepted. So remember, he is talking to saints. Okay? That's the context of this, this scripture is critically important to understanding the term predestined. Predestined is not about the person, but the future state of the person's identity in Christ. I'm going to repeat that. This is not about the person, but it's about the future state of a person whose identity is in Christ. Oh, okay. So my, my personhood, my identity in Christ, includes the fact that I'm adopted as a son or daughter in Jesus Christ, according to the good pleasure of his will. He want, his will is that we're, that's part of the deal. When we, when we come into Christ, we are adopted. We are in the family. And nothing can separate us that. To the praise and glory of his grace by which he made us accepted. Wow. Okay, so we see adoption and accepted. What's the accepted mean? Accepted is, is that we have a guaranteed a destiny. See the word predestined? Destiny, we have a guaranteed destiny if we so choose to act on that. Because at the end of the day, he's not going to puppet you into your destiny. Right? It's going to be up to you to discover your destiny through, the, through living and breathing through his word and through prayer and through praise and from worship. That guaranteed destiny is available to all of the redeemed. The first of that is the fact that the destiny is in Christ. So I have his nature through the Holy Spirit. But it's up to us to discover it and execute his will for us. So we, we get through the door. Whew, I'm in the door. I'm in the building. Because we're so worried about our eternal destiny. But that's, that's the end. That's not the journey that we're called to be on. The destiny. And so I, ask, I pose the question, how do you discover his des your destiny and his will? Anybody want to make a suggestion? Have you even thought about that? The beauty of this scripture that got all distracted because of the misperception of what the word predestined was and caused all of this debate 
across the history of Christendom when in fact it's not what people got all excited about. He's not picking and choosing. It's not a fatalistic approach that a group is going to be in no matter what they do and the other group is going to go out no matter what they've done. It's about he's speaking to his body, the people in his body, and saying, look, guys, there is more to this. There is a future that God has planned for you to execute on. And the whole idea is how do we discover that? Well, I, I can just tell you that when, as I look back and reflect, for me, and I believe it fits with the New Testament mandate, the two key components to discover your destiny is daily reading the scripture and daily praying. Yeah. If you don't develop that habit, you're going to wander around, what's the will of God for me? What's the will of God? I said, well, if you pray, no, I hadn't prayed. If you read the word, no, I hadn't read the word. The future for you, the destiny, will be discovered. And I will tell you, there is uh, in no question in my mind as we go along through this pathway that there's some richness, there's some radicalness that will come with that. Because the enemy would rather you just feel comfortable in your little comfort zone, but he's very disruptive, the Holy Spirit is. He will disrupt you. He will change your expectations you're going well I think I, I thought it was this and now it's this and you're scratching your head and you're going what does that mean it is exciting to to be disrupted you know the old self needs to be disrupted all right everybody good yeah. all right let's move on verse 7 Ephesians 1 verse 7 in him we have redemption through his blood the forgiveness of sin, according to the riches of his grace, which he made to abound toward us in all wisdom and prudence. Again, several big words there, but as we just mentioned, we receive the assurance of the full forgiveness for all the wrong we have done because of Christ's bloodshed for me at the cross. That's the two, two blanks there, the bloodshed. This this whole idea, and it breaks my heart because the enemy wants us to say we're not valuable. We're not that valuable to God. Yeah. That you, you, that can't, it can't be that easy to have your sins forgiven. He did all the work. He did everything. He went to the cross. He shed his blood. And that bloodshed was was the foundation of how we can live in Christ. It couldn't be possible without that because there would be no remission of sin without it. Okay. I'm excited. I, I just want to... I'd jump down and dance, but I'd probably hurt my knee. So, um, Partnership. These next five verses are about partnership, partnership in God for purpose. Okay, we're moving toward, we've got this destiny thing going, but then we've got to figure out what this will thing is. Okay, so we're going to talk about that. So verse 9, having made known to us, look at this, the mystery of his will according to his good pleasure, which he purposed in himself. Let's pause for a second there. This mystery of his will is this, it really was a, his divine purpose for mankind that was kind of cloaked in the Old Testament. But if you read the Old Testament, knowing what you know from the New Testament, you can see this story being woven. And the, all of the events of the Old Testament were part of this whole concealed divine purpose that God had for mankind. So the mystery was a divine secret in the Old Tef Testament that was referenced by the prophets, but fully disclosed in the New Testament for us to understand and execute. So it's the mystery of his will, okay? People struggle with that term, the will of God. What's the will of God? You know, I've been asked that multiple times. What's the will of God? Well, we're going to discover that here in just a moment. Verse 10, that in the dispensation of the fullness of times, 
He gathers all things in Christ, both that are in heaven and which are on earth in him. Now, we, we see life as a timeline, don't we? It's, it's linear, okay? And in fact, we try to read Scripture from the standpoint of it being a linear event, okay? So we go, the world was created, heaven comes to earth, the final return. So everything is linear in there. So I would challenge you, and we tend to think about dispensationalism as being these ages of the Bible. And while, in fact, there are true, we are in the post, we're in the church age, which is the time where the church is the representation of the body of Christ. I would just challenge you that when, when Paul was talking about the dispensation of the fullness of time, we could spend a lot of time, no pun intended, talking about this. But the dispensation here is not a restriction to a specific time, but rather... God is dispensing his message through human history. Think about that for a second. He's telling his story even today after the final verse of Genesis, of of Revelation. But after that final verse, he's still telling his story through human history on the basis of those great Leaders, people that have emerged. I mean, we have lots of names that have, if we were still writing a book, which we're not, there are names that have occurred. A.W. Tozier, I mean, Charles Spurgeon, people that would, are revealing the dispensation of how God continues to act in the world today. Does that make sense? Okay, good. All right, verse 11. In him, here we go, we have also obtained an inheritance, being predestined. Okay, remember, destined, it's not about the person, it's about the future state of the person. Okay? Because you are already in, if you're reading this book, cause he, he, this letter, because he wrote it to you as saints, right? Okay? So, the future state of the person and our destiny in Christ, according to the purpose of him, who works what? Anything? All things. According to the counsel of his will. Okay. So we got a lot of words here today that are kind of important that I hope that you will, it'll begin your interest to study this out because I'm not, I'm not the expert. He's the expert. He's the teacher, the Holy Spirit within you. So the challenge is to study this out, see how it applies to you. Verse 12, that we who first trusted in Christ should be to the praise of his glory. So inheritance and will are the two blanks in that that sentence. So the term God's will is used four times in these first 11 verses. So you think that's important? Okay. What's God's will? So I ask those questions because we should really be able to say, in my opinion, I think God's will is, okay, is God's will what? It's his will for you to make a disciple. Is is his will for you? And I, I look at this from the standpoint of, how do we assess where we are and then couple the casting of what if Paul is telling us about the very deep, These are deep principles, guys, okay? I will promise you if I was a saint in, in Ephesus and reading this, I'd be going, what in the world is he talking about? Okay, so the truth is he knew he was inspiring them to a future state. Okay, they weren't there. They weren't where um, he knew they needed to be, but he wanted to give them something that would be foundational to them. So when we think about the will of God, I wrote a question in there. Are you willing to give up on your plans 
for his plan. You see how this all links together. We have a destiny. We came to Christ from a spiritually dead state, but we had all of these things working in our life. We were going in a different pathway. We had our own plan before we were in Christ. And so the question is, how does that plan get reconfigured, disrupted with his plan? It's not easy, is it? I'm not here to say I got this figured out because I don't. I just made me go, got more distressed because, you know, the truth is, this is the, these are the things we should be talking about and thinking about because at the end of the day, this world is not going to get better. And if you not are not prepared living in your destiny full of his presence, full of his spirit, full of his word, I will tell you the world will come, is coming against us and will, it will come to a point where you have to make a decision. Who, yeah. who are you with and who are you not with? That's good. Okay? And so the only way we can do this is pursue the deepness of what Paul is talking about here. How do we live in this, in this will that he talks about? So we'll leave that question for your answer later. Are you willing to give up on your plans for his? Because I will tell you, don't make that decision lightly. Count the cost. Verse 13. In him you also trusted after you the heard the word of truth the gospel of your salvation, and whom also, having believed, you were what? Sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise, who is the guarantee of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession to the praise of his glory. Wow. I'm glad that's the last verse. So he doubles down on inheritance, and he talks about being sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. Wow. As I was thinking about, and and our worship team talked about the prodigal son, and I talked about the, I was thinking during that real talk about how the return of the prodigal. So I saw this, at least in my, the way I think about things is, being sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise was the same thing as the father putting that ring on the prodigal's finger and saying, you're mine. This ministry and presence of the Holy Spirit is absolutely critical to any growth, any destiny, anything that you are called to disrupt because of what God's calling you into. I will tell you that that ceiling, you know, there are so many, and I'm just reading accounts and, and I was reading another thing in A.W. Tozier's talking about how folks, when you talk about the ministry of the Holy Spirit, and they've been in church all their life, and they literally, eyes roll back in their head because they've never experienced that. They've never walked in this palpable presence that changes the way you think, what you respond to, what you're drawn to. So I will tell you that this being sealed with the promise of the Holy Spirit is critical for saints to understand that that component, that activeness of the spirit of the living God within us, who is the, and goes on to say, not only is it the ring, but it's the guarantee. I love what I read about this. It's the deposit. It's the down payment. It's the first installment. The investment that through Christ made in us through the Holy Spirit. It's God's title to your life. Jesus did everything for you. And the, he purchased you. You know, many of you have, you're so excited when you pay off your house and you have the title. Well, the Holy Spirit, that is the title. It's, that's the affirmation 
that you're his. So I'm going to invite the, the worship team to come up. I want to close with, talked about this will, his will. So he has a will, correct, for us. The way I break this down in my, I'm very finite and linear. That's why I have handouts and use notes because I don't want to make it mess up anything. But think about this for a minute. And there's an image that um, Amy's going to project. So don't be afraid of predestined. Your destiny, your personhood in Christ for adoption, we're in his family, and there's a promise, there's an inheritance. So you and your family, when you have children and you follow, there's going to be an inheritance in Christ that will happen in your family. This inheritance thing, we could talk about this forever, okay? But there's inheritance, working all things according to the counsel of his will. Some simple suggestions. I believe all of us in Christ have a common will. There's certain common to all of our lives. Make disciples. Study his word. Know his ways. That's a common will. It's the foundation of the New Testament church. The apostles' doctrine, fellowship, um, sharing meals and prayer. Those are the common things that all of us share in his will as members of his body. But I do believe there's a customized will for you. There's a destiny that, you know, if you're able to discover what that is in Christ, it's probably going to be incrementally revealed, a stepwise fashion, at least that was for me, that the more you are engaged with him, he'll give you the next step. The more you press in, the next step. The more you press in, the next step. So if we got the whole will all at once, the customized one, scare you to death. You mean what? I'm going to do what? But it's a beautiful thing. And so Paul was writing to us to give us great courage to trust what the word says. So if you'll stand. You know, as I, as I was praying this morning, I just want, you know, I, I know that all of us are a different place in the journey, but the Lord really stirred in me. You know, one of those connection points that has to be critically active is the Holy Spirit in you. Connecting to our Father. Knowing the heartbeat of Him. And so if you're really struggling, just today, if you'll come and talk to one of our prayer team. If you're struggling with really knowing about that seal of the Holy Spirit. Settle that today. Because you can, you can be sitting in pews all over the world. But unless what Paul talked about, that you're sealed with the Holy Spirit, please settle that because you can't grow. You're going to be stuck. You're going to be stuck with an eternal plan instead of a plan for today. And so I engage you and, and ask you to please join in worship today because God's got something planned for us in worship today. And I think his order of what the music that was prepared for the first set and the message that God wrote, okay, this is, we don't just wake up and go pull something off the internet, okay? We have to hear from God. We're accountable to his body. So I believe this next time of worship is specially prepared for us. So Father God, as we engage with you, through the word, through worship, through, through prayer and intercession, we ask that you would just move in might and power, change us today. We all need change. We all need to become refreshed 
We all need to be um, more in you. So we just celebrate that today, Father God. And we just bring this all to you as, a, as an offering of worship and obedience. In your name we pray.
Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John were watching Jesus throughout his mystery, the ministry. And the thing that strikes me over and over again that he comments on is people's faith. It's faith that moves him. It's faith. It's nothing I do. I have oil. I can pour it out. I can sing a million songs. But he delights in my in my faith in him. And so as you, as we sing this bridge again in the chorus, I want you to imagine that it's a sacrifice to pour oil out, to sing a song when you don't feel like it. But our feelings lie to us all the time. And he's worthy and we're to worship in spite of it and so as let as we let our faith rise up as we sing this out let that be your act of worship it's the faith so is it a fragrance then i'll pour my oil out is it a life laid I give my vows is it a song I sing is every melody to something that moves you and is it a fragrance then I'll pour my oil out is it a life laid down then here I give my is it a song I sing? Here's every melody to tell me what moves you. Oh, I just want to move you. Savior's robe as he walks into this room where people pray, where we hear praises, he hears faith. Through the sun of faith, Jesus, yeah. There's a sound I love to hear. It's the sound of the Savior's robe as he walks into the room where people pray, where we hear worship, he hears.
can we make some noise for Jesus? Thank you, Jesus. Mountains are still being moved. Strongholds are still being loosed. God, we believe in. Yes, we can see it. Wonders are still what you do. Sing it again. Mountains are still being church is all about. It's saying, I I need a community and I need the Lord to move. So I want you to pray over them as we declare this over these people and over these situations right now. Miracles
We're going to keep playing in here. If you need prayer, you just keep praying. You just to keep declaring over each other's lives, reminding them that God did everything. He sent his son on the cross to die for you and for me. God, I just thank you so much for moving. Thank you for meeting us here. Thank you for coming. We're just going to keep on playing. So if you want to stay in worship, stay in worship.